So it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, which is uh, Professor Richard de Grace. Uh, it, there is a lot to say about Richard. Uh, after his PhD at the University of Groningen, uh, he held two postdoctoral positions at the University of Virginia and the University of Cambridge. Then he joined the University of Sheffield and uh, Peking University as a full professor. And uh, since uh, 2018, he moved uh, to Macquarie University in Sydney, where he's working uh, now. And uh, Richard has been one of the scientific editors for the Astrophysical Journal and Astrophysical Journal Letters. And uh, he received uh, some important awards, like the Selby Award for Excellence in Science by the Australian Academy of Science. So Richard has a broad scientific interest that covers many topics, especially in stellar astrophysics, from stellar population in galactic open clusters to other stellar population located, located at larger distances. And in fact, astronomical distance determination is the fil rouge of the today's topic, right, Richard? Richard, yes. Yep. So, so yes, uh, Richard, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, so, you know that this colloquium was uh, meant to be a physical colloquium. We organized this uh, before COVID, so our original plan uh, was to have you at Monash. It's not possible for the moment, but maybe it will be possible in the future. And uh, also, I would like to thank you for the choice of the topic, which I believe is not only very interesting, but also affects uh, all of us. And uh, so I have talked enough. Uh, so Richard, I, I leave the space to you. Uh, after Richard's talk, we will have the opportunity to ask some questions as usual. Okay, thanks Richard. All right, thank you Lorenzo, I'll share my screen. Uh, it's a pleasure to give this talk, albeit uh, remotely at the moment. We, uh, I received the invitation to speak about a year ago and the plan was to come in February of this year and then that was on, on March, I don't actually remember. And then it was moved because of COVID to today. And of course, uh, Melbourne is still under, under lockdown. I'm very sorry that this is the case, but I hope that you will get out of it soon. Um, yeah, we, uh, we just uh, welcomed a new a staff member within our faculty, a new faculty general manager who came from Melbourne. And she was uh, saying that she's uh, relishing the opportunity to walk around uh, outside without a face mask, for instance, which is what we can do here in Sydney. Right, so in terms of the contents of the talk, I'd like to talk to you about a series of seven papers that uh, we wrote over the last uh, six years or so with my good friend uh, Giuseppe Bono from Rome Observatory, um, where in essence we analyzed the entire body, body of papers on uh, galaxies in the local group and beyond in terms of their distance estimates. So this is in essence a result of a number of meta-analyses um, going from the galactic center all the way out to the coma cluster. And eventually at the end of the talk, we'll have a pretty self-consistent astronomical distance framework. Let me get started. So we'll start by looking at the nearest galaxies, particularly the Magellanic Clouds. And for those of you who are uh, cosmologists and perhaps some students, these are the large and small Magellanic Clouds on the top and at the bottom uh, respectively. Um, the large Magellanic Cloud is often seen as the first rung on the extra galactic distance ladder. So um, the way that these ladders work is that you calibrate one rung of the ladder and you use that calibration and, this, and the same physical properties of your tracer population to get out to the next rung and then you recalibrate it again, etc. Hence the name distance ladder. The LMC hosts a statistically large sam sample of standard candles. Standard candles are objects that have the same intrinsic luminosity no matter where they are, and so differences in luminosity imply differences in distances, barring the effects of extinction and all that, of course. <clears throat> now, in the LMC, all of these standard candles are roughly at the same distance. Um, there's a little bit of depth, but not too much, and very fortunately, there is little extinction. The LMC and also the SMC are located in the far south, uh, you're looking through a very small uh, fraction of the galactic disk, and therefore there is very little extinction towards objects in the LMC and the SMC. There's some internal, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. 
Now, the LMC also has as an advantage that it contains large numbers of tracers that are both population one, so those are the, uh, the young stars, and population two objects, so older stars. And that would allow them to be used as links back to galactic tracers, hence building that distance ladder. And in addition to that, we can get direct distances from, uh, for instance, the exploding supernova 1987A ring, as well as eclipsing binaries, for which uh, we can get ge geometric measurements of their distances. So there's a very good body of, of uh, tracers there that allow us to get a pretty good distance to the LMC. And we'll see that in just a moment. Now, when the Hubble Space Telescope was designed, um, the uncertainty, the idea of the Hubble Space Telescope was that they wanted to determine the Hubble constant with an accuracy of better than 10%. Now, in the systematic uncertainty to the, uh, in, in the Hubble constant, half of the systematic uncertainty was associated with the uncertain distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud. So the Large Magellanic Cloud is a key, key extragalactic uh, rung. So at the bottom you can see, um, after the Hubble Space Telescope key project concluded in 2001, the uh, best value they found for the Hubble constant was 72 plus or minus three plus or minus seven kilometers per second per megaparsec, and that seven is just below the 10% uncertainty. Half of that uncertainty at the time was due to uncertainties in the distance to the LMC. Right, now the, the HST key project did not only determine the Hubble constant, it also determined the distance to the LMC. Uh, they came up with a distance of 50.1 plus or minus a little uh, kiloparsecs, or a distance modulus of 18.50 plus or minus 0.10 magnitudes. Keep that number in mind, we'll get back to it uh, later on as well. We use it as, as, as our calibration of the next runs. Uh, their result was based on, in essence, the CVE period luminosity relation, adopting a, another geometric distance measure to uh, the Maser Galaxy NGC 4258, and a lot of additional techniques including the tip of the red giant branch magnitude, the red clump magnitude, RR Larry, and a whole range of other uh, tracers. The HST key project's value and the distance to the LMC solved what was called the short versus long LMC distance debate. And let me explain what I mean by that. If you look at a random period in the 1990s at distance moduli as published, distance moduli to the LMC, here are a bunch of them, you can see that um, in the beginning part of this period, uh, pretty much all authors suggested a distance modulus of around 18.6 to 18.7. While at, at the end, towards the end of this period, that had changed to a much shorter distance of 18.3-ish uh, magnitude for, as a distance modulus. Now, this long versus short debate actually implies that we're dealing with a case of publication bias, uh, where of course, what you do as a scientist, you look at previous results in the literature and you see if your, uh, if your results matches uh, within the uncertainties what previous authors have published. And if, if it does, then it's easy, you publish it. And if it doesn't, you wonder if you've made a mistake. And so people jumped onto the bandwagon and only published uh, values that actually matched values published, uh, close to values that were published previously. This is not the first time that publication bias occurred. Uh, it's very well known. This occurred also for the Hubble constant. And this is a video that uh, shows a comp compilation of uh, Hubble constant values as a period of time. You can see the clock, the years tick by in the top right corner there. Um, and this is from the compilation of John Hukra a few years ago. And you can see how the Hubble constant changed. If the first part is just uh, recalibration. But then from the 1970s onwards, we get in essence two streaks of Hubble parameters, one close to 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and one much closer to 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And that also implies uh, publication bias. We'll, we'll zoom into that la latter part of the period uh, once again, so you can see this a bit better. Uh, I have color-coded all of the uh, data points provided by Alan Sandwich and uh, Taman and their collaborators in blue, and all of the data points provided by uh, Sidney Vandenberg, uh, uh, Gerard de Vaucouleur, and their collab collaborators in red. And you can see that they consistently stuck to either large or small values for the Hubble constant, publication bias, in other words. That came from a book I wrote in 2011. Now, 
actually mentioning that book that I wrote is a textbook on, uh, on determination of astronomical distances. Uh, lots of techniques described, etc. And in that book, when, when researching that book, I came across a paper by Brad Schaefer from Louisiana State University, who claimed that he had seen trends in uh, LMC distance determination since the publication of the HST Key Project in 2001. He found 31 measurements of the distance to the LMC, and he concluded that they seem to cluster too tightly around the key project's value, and therefore he suggested that the LMC distance might be subject to publication bias. Now, I didn't feel very com comfortable reading that, and uh, I included this as a reference in, in my own textbook, but I felt that some more work was required here to really get down to the bottom of it. And so here is what Shaver suggested. Um, he claimed that, so what, what, what he is showing Okay, sorry, let me get to that figure in a moment. He claimed first that there was there is publication bias in all measures of the distance modulus to the Large Magellanic Cloud after 2002 because the uncertainties in those values were not distributed like a Gaussian. Now, the problem is the uncertainties before 2002 were not distributed like Gaussians either. And this also assumes that uh, the conditions have remained comparable before and after 2001. 2002. Now, of course, um, as scientists, we tend to improve our work, and so conditions haven't remained comparable, but we have had better calibrations and smaller error bars because of larger numbers or better understanding of the physics. He did not include any detailed assessment of the systematic uncertainties. We'll get back to that in a moment. And uh, his, his results were based on a simple application of the statistical KS test. Now, to apply a KS test, and that's what you're seeing in the figure at the top here, by the way, um, there is a difference there in that figure between the smooth uh, curved line and the uh, stepped uh, solid line. And there's a large difference, and he said the difference is too large to be random. The problem is, to apply a KS test, you assume that your underlying distribution is Gaussian, which it isn't, and you also assume that your sample of data points is independent, and that the values are identically distributed, which they are not. So there are all kinds of problems with this uh, uh, statement. And then finally, and that's the most important issue, uh, Schaefer relies on an incomplete database. He found 31 measures. There were at least uh, twice that number that we found in later work. So that's what we did. We said that was with, with uh, Giuseppe Bono and also James Wicker, who is an astrostatistician at the National Observatories in China, uh, close to Peking University where I worked for about eight and a half years. Um, so we went through the literature. And so the way to do that is you type in LMC or Large Magellanic Cloud in ADS in the box for an object and you see what comes out. Now you can imagine for the LMC, you get lots of papers. So we limited this to 1990 onwards. We found 16,000 papers. And yes, I went through each and every single paper uh, myself uh, to see if there was a new or an updated distance measurement in there. I found 233 distance measurements, and they are plotted in the top left uh, panel here. As a function of publication date, you can see what the published distance moduli are. Uh, for uh, reference, I have also plotted at 18.5 a reference line, but that's not necessarily the final result. That's just for your, uh, to guide the eye. I've split them up into uh, variable stars at the top right, uh, stellar population features, the bottom left, and uh, uh, geometric measures, the bottom right. Uh, you can actually see in that top left plot and also in the top right plot that around the year 2000, there are two groups, the, the long distances at the top and the short distances at the bottom, and they disappear in the mid 2000s. Now, what did this tell us? Um, oh, we looked at, um, well, this, this just tells you that we looked at uh, lots of different measurements in, in papers. We, we assessed whether or not we should include them uh, and whether they, are in, whether they were independent, etc. I can talk about that later if you like, but we tried to do a careful job here. Um, we looked into the systematic uncertainties as well. The systematic, systematic uncertainties affecting LMC distance measures include the zero-point calibration, what it was based on at the time, mostly on Hipparchos parallaxes, a few uh, parallax measurements with the faint guidance sensor on HST, and then a whole bunch of other parallax measurements. measurements. Uh, functional form adopted for the calibration relations, uh, what kind of polynomial order, and most importantly, the Lutz-Kelker type bias in parallax, parallax measurements. If you don't know what that means, that means that if you look at a, at a statistically complete sample of objects 
uh, for which you have, to, uh, which are based on parallax measurements, they will, there will be a bit of an uncertainty on those measurements. And so it's more likely that you will measure objects from just outside your, outside your binary, uh, boundary because the parallaxes have scattered to slightly greater values. Then, uh, so you get a few more objects from outside of your boundary. And so that means that your, uh, your, your uh, sample of objects is biased in the sense that it, it uh, looks like it's determined by a slightly greater distance than is actually uh, the true uh, average distance of your sample. That's a lutz kelker type bias, and that's actually important in the context of determining uh, distance measures to the LMC. We also uh, looked at different metallicity uh, and extinction calibrations and corrections, um, transformations between filter systems, and more, perhaps inter most interestingly, where the, the emission of supernova 1987A came from. And I'd like to show, show that here just briefly. Um, at the Top is a, is a real picture of the ring uh, surrounding supernova 1987A. Um, and you can determine its, its absolute size uh, by looking at variability of the central source and then variability a, a little bit, little while later from the ring because lights coming from the central source will be reflected or bounced off the ring. And so you know how long uh, it takes for, for light to get to the ring and at the speed of light, you know exactly how long that distance is in actual units. You can also measure that distance in arc seconds and that gives you a direct distance measure. That's all good and that's a good geometric distance measurement, but it involves a number of assumptions. The assumptions and the questions you have to ask are listed here. Does the emission used to measure delay times at a variety of wavelengths actually originate from the same regions in the ring? And does the emission start immediately when photons hit the gas in the ring? Is there a delay? The plot on the right shows you what the ring looks like in the optical with HST at X-rays with Chandra. And you see there's no picture in 1996 because Chandra did not yet fly at that time. And at radio wavelengths with the ATCA. Uh, it was suggested that Ultraviolet lines, N3 and N4, may originate from the ring's inner edge, and the, while well, the optical oxygen-3 lines came from the main body. So that's a different, different uh, position, and therefore potentially get, that gives you a, difference, uh, a different distance, uh, because of the different timescales involved. Um, it turns out that in the worst case, this could lead to a distance differential of up to 7%, but in reality, the uh, ionization potentials of oxygen three and uh, N3 and N4 are pretty similar, and so are their spatial distributions. So it's likely that this is not a major issue. So supernova 1987A is a good benchmark for the distance of the LMC. Um, we looked at uh, our other objects, and we looked at two-year running averages here for um, a, a range of different objects for which, which we had good statistics. We identified a few um, uh, periods indicated, indicated by the uh, horizontal red uh, arrow bars, where it looked like the, uh, the, the data points were clustered too closely together or where the arrow bars suddenly disappeared. And we looked at those objects in more detail. Now, to make a long story short, and I have that on my next slides, but I don't want to go through it in detail, uh, the error bars became very small and the data points yielded very similar distance moduli simply because most of those measures were based on the same data. The same data, the same calibration, so there's no, no wonder that you get pretty much the same results. That's, I can go into this in great detail if you like, but that's in essence the bottom line of this. We looked at Cepheids, the best distance modulus for Cepheids, different types, was 18.48 plus or minus 0 0.08. Remember the Hubble Space Telescope key project uh, gave 18.50 plus or minus 0.10. We did the same thing for RLRI, same results. Oh, I uh, don't have that here. Uh, again, lots of overlap, lots of similar calibrations and even similar data sets. A lot of the data was based on Clementini et al's uh, paper from 2003. So no publication bias in the Cepheids no publication bias in the RLRI distances. We had a good distance from 1987A. We had then, around the time we wrote this paper, uh, another good measure based on eclipsing binaries. This was a paper in Nature by uh, George Greg Gregor Petrzynski, um, who showed that, who used eclipsing binaries to determine distances very accurately. They used late type eclipsing binaries for the first time. Uh, and, and using late type eclipsing, eclipsing binaries you don't need to make too many assumptions. If you use early types, 
there are many more assumptions involved, for instance, in terms of the radiative transfer through the stellar atmospheres and all that. You don't have those assumptions in latex. And so what they came up with was this plot, which shows here um, for seven of their eclipsing binaries, what the deviation is from the mean of uh, their distance determination, which is very small, and they, that yielded a distance of uh, pretty much 50 plus or minus 0.2 kiloparsecs, the most accurate distance to the LMC obtained until that time. So that leads me to our verdict on the Large Magellanic Cloud. Friedman, 2001, Hubble Space Telescope Key Project, 18.50 plus or minus 0.10. Pirozinski, very close with a much smaller error bar. And then our Cepheids and the full statistical reanalysis of 16,000 papers gives you pretty much the same results. That was a lot of work for pretty much the same result, but at least it's statistically validated now. Now, we did the same thing for a whole range of other objects, and I, I will not go through all of them in great detail, but I'd like to show you the results. First of all, let's look at the small Magellanic Cloud. That's the galaxy at the bottom left here. Did the same thing. Uh, almost 10,000 papers, just over 200 data points. Again, uh, different types of tracers. And what that uh, this was interesting. I talked to a colleague of mine from Leiden University, Jan Lop, and he said that he found that uh, in a Hertzsprung, from the Hertzsprung Russell diagram, uh, already tried to obtain a parallax to the SMC. And this is the bit of my paper uh, that we wrote about it. Hertzsprung boldly attempted to measure a trigonometric parallax to the SMC, reporting a value of 10 to the power minus four arc seconds. Although this corresponds to a distance of 30,000 light years, his paper refers to a distance of just 3,000 light years. Whether or not this was a genuine typo or one of the first cases of publication bias remains unclear. And that was a quote from Jan Lok. Interesting. Again, we did the Cepheids, we did um, the the red clump and tip of the red giant branch stars with the uh, RLRI, we did not find any publication bias in distances to the SMC. Uh, here are some of the distances that we ob obtained. You can see them. There are some uh, eclipsing binaries uh, here as well. It's a much smaller number than the, in the LMC. Different types of Cepheids, fundamental mode and first overtone, RLRI, our uh, red clump stars, tip of the red giant branch, and some star clusters. That leads to a distance modulus with a small error bar, 0.02 magnitudes at the top of the screen here, but there is some tension at the one to two sigma level. That's not surprising because the SMC is not as flat as the LMC. It's actually quite deep. Depending on who you believe, it might be up to 20 kiloparsecs in depth. I don't, quite, I don't think that's quite the value, but it's at least a few kiloparsecs deep. And not all tracers are, are found exactly co-spatially with any other tracer. So that's why you get a bit of tension here in uh, the best values of, in the distance. We did the same thing for M31, 13,000 papers to go through. Um, uh, again, a lot of work on this. Um, and that led us to M31, a distance to M31 of 776 kiloparsecs. Uh, we did not just do uh, M31, we did M32, M33, and uh, about five or six other galaxies in the M31 group just because we could, just because we were doing it at the time anyway. And so this is a self-consistent, an internally self-consistent uh, set of distance moduli all the way from the LMC to uh, the M31 group. But perhaps the most important distance is the distance to the galactic center, and we haven't touched that yet. Uh, R0 not, not is a benchmark for a variety of methods of distance determination, both inside and outside of the Milky Way. It's a calibration uh, step. Um, knowing the distance to the galactic center accurately has a direct impact on the distances, masses, and luminosities of many objects in the Milky Way, and also on the size, mass, and rotation pr parameters of the entire galaxy. Most luminosities and masses scale as distance squared, and masses based on densities or orbital modeling scale as distance cubed. So we have a different set of distances here. Um, and so eventually knowing the distance to R0 better uh, gives us a, a better handle on the, uh, on the Hubble constant and therefore on the age of the universe. So that's a big over overarching goal. So we did the same thing. You can see how all the data points here again. In, uh, have a look at the top left uh, plot here, where you see everything from the first measurement in the 1930s, 1940s, until uh, 2016, when we published our work. Um, 
overplotted are the IAU values recommended uh, at different times. And interestingly enough, between 1965 and 1985, the distance to the galactic center that was recommended was 10 kiloparsecs. Since 1985, it's been 8.5 kiloparsecs. Now, you see all these data points here in different panels. You can also see on top of each panel what type of distance we're talking about. A few of them are direct measurements. So these are parallaxes and uh, uh, yeah, objects in the galactic center for which we can get good distances. Uh, quite a few of them are centroids. Um, Shapley, for instance, using uh, uh, globular clusters, already used the centroids of the globular cluster system to determine the distance to the galactic center. Uh, and then there are disk kinematics for which you need to adopt uh, a model of a rotation model for the galaxy. If you type in Milky Way, uh, in, or galactic center rather, in ADS, at the time that we did this, we got more than 23 and a half thousand papers. So that was a big job to get through. Uh, fortunately, I had, a, had some spare time and I would just flick through them at night watching television and hopefully that did not introduce any errors. <laughs> Um, so we looked at different distances here. I will not go into this in, in too much detail. Um, but if you then look at the values, keeping in mind that the IAU recommendation is 8.5 uh, kiloparsecs at the current time, you can see that most of the values that I cite here, look in that, in that red box, and also look further down to the bottom, most of those values are less than 8.5 kiloparsecs. Um, some of the best values are the geometric distances, including the orbits of the S stars around the galactic center black hole by uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez, our new Nobel Prize laureate since yesterday, and also statistical parallaxes. All of them imply a distance to the galactic center much less than that proposed by the IAU. Now here, of course, uh, shows, uh, is, a, is a movie that shows you the motions of the stars around the galactic center over a period of about 10 years. And you can trace their orbits very well, very beautiful elliptical orbits, as you can see here. And the latest value uh, that I've included here is from the Graffiti Collaboration from last year. That, that collaboration determined a very accurate distance to the galactic center. Uh, shown at the bottom here with very small uncertainties. So that's geometrically the best distance to the galactic center. Based on our statistical analysis of 23,000 papers, we found a best distance of 8.3 kiloparsecs plus or minus 0.2 statistical and 0.4 systematic uncertainty. So that gives us a benchmark to tie the entire local astronomical distance scale to. And here are the other values I mentioned previously. In terms, uh, we did the same, same, same thing about galactic rotation parameters. I don't want to go into detail, but I want to show you something here. Um, what's very well known is the ratio of the galactic rotation velocity to that of the distance to the galactic center. You can see that at the bottom here, small uncertainties. Given that we had determined 8.3 as our best uh, distance, 8.3 kiloparsecs as our best distance to the galactic center, that yielded immediately a preferred galactic uh, rotation rate of 225 kilometers per second, slightly higher than the IAU recommendation of 220. At the bottom here, actually, uh, that might, the, the, sorry, the, the plot underneath here might be of interest. Um, you can see that uh, what we show here on, on, in the left panel, uh, the vertical dotted blue lines show you the IAU recommendation of 220 kilometers per second. Um, from 1985, and you can see that that is only really met by galactic mass models. Most of the other um, uh, galactic rotation constants seem to imply a slightly faster galactic rotation speed. But that's based, that's not calibrated to a distance of 8.3 kiloparsecs. So you need to take that into account. And if you do that, we get 225 kilometers per second with small uncertainties. Now, in terms of the galactic, uh, the shape of our galaxy, last year we uh, we, my postdoc from in China, Xiaodian Chen, shown here, did a, did a fantastic job um, in uh, trying to trace the shape of our Milky Way using Cepheid variables. And uh, the picture at the bottom here shows you uh, uh, kind of an exaggerated um, representation of the Milky Way. It's not that warp, but it is warped, and the warp is not just uh, uh, sitting in the same plane, but it's, it's uh, twisted as well. And I'll show you, 
show you that. This was published in Nature Astronomy around February of last year. And uh, that was based on a database we had put together using WISE, the WISE catalog of period, uh, periodic variable stars of about 55,000 stars, just over 1,200 Cepheids. Uh, optical and infrared data. And you can see what that distribution of stars, Cepheid variables, looks like in the plots at the bottom. Uh, blue is infrared measurements and red is optical measurements. And if you then look at the three-dimensional distribution, this is what it looks like. So we saw, we saw a clear warp in the Milky Way. Obviously, at that time, most of the Cepheids were on our side of the Milky Way. Um, the warp that we found on our side of the Milky Way was traced very, traces very well warps seen in pulsars, in dust, in H1, and in other types of objects, as you can see uh, in the top left panel. And there is even some flaring of the disk shown in the bottom panel. So all of that is consistent with previous determinations using other tracers. This half a year later, um, a competing paper was published by uh, a Polish team in science, uh, finding in essence the same thing as us. This, they, they just came up with a nicer picture and they used about twice the sample of Cepheids, independently determined same results. So that's actually uh, quite, quite quite good, but we found the same result. What we also did and, and they didn't do is we looked at the line of nodes from the galactic center by the sun outwards. You can see the gray data points with arrow bars here. This is the line of nodes as a function of distance outside of the solar circle. And you can see that uh, it twists a bit. So it's like a spiral. There's like a spiral structure in the warp. And so when we released the press release because of the Nature Astronomy paper, we called our galactic disk warp, warped and twisted. Now this was taken up by the sun, don't you love the sun? Milky Way is actually twisted as first accurate 3D map of our galaxy reveals bizarre warped shape. And then uh, it says scientists are pondering what this means for humanity. And at the bottom you can see that we're, we are referred to as space boffins. So this is all very interesting, but at least it got out to a general audience and perhaps an audience that would not normally be interested in astronomy. So that's, that's all good. Another interesting uh, headline we, we got was here. This is from um, uh, the, the Press Trust of India. First 3D map shows a twisted Milky Way. And then the subheading says, research reveals our solar system is not stable. So they had no idea what the, the, the size scales are between galaxies and solar systems clearly, but this is again, it got out to a general audience and, and that's, that's generally good, I, I would say. Now our paper, we were very proud, made it in the top 100 uh, altmetric papers last year, number 60 out of um, uh, 2.7 million uh, articles. So that's, that's quite good. Doesn't mean it's correct. It just means that many people talked about it, which by some measures is, is a good thing. Um, and so we believe that this is a pretty decent uh, representation of the disk of our Milky Way. And this was even made into a movie by our friends from Swinburne University. So we believe that this is a pretty good uh, reproduction of what the Milky Way looks like in 3D. So it's not a flat disk, it's quite severely warped actually. And when my, uh, my, my Chinese postdoc saw this, his first comment was, oh, the Milky Way looks like a Pringle. And so there you go, possibly it might. Right, so in the meantime, we have just published a new catalog, the uh, Zwicky Transient Factory Catalog of Variable Stars, um, almost a million stars in there. And this is the distribution on the left-hand side here of the Cepheids and the Milky Way as we know it now. And that's what it looks like on the right-hand side uh, across the galactic disk. And we still lack some Cepheids behind the galactic center Clearly, it's difficult to see them there because of uh, a lot of dust between us and the galactic center, but we have a much better coverage now of the galactic disk than we used to before. Now, that will help us in uh, hopefully ascertaining what the causes of the warp, because some causes require um, symmetric warps and others require just a warp on one side of the Milky Way. So that's work in progress. Uh, keep an eye out for results, I would say. Now, the final in the final, uh, maybe five to 10 minutes, I'd like to talk about uh, taking this work further to greater distances. And so the obvious next step was the Virgo cluster, 
we did the same thing again, all the way back to the very early stages. You can actually see in the top left panel here, there are some data points sitting at, in the corner. Uh, initially, uh, it was thought that the Virgo cluster was much closer than it is, uh, than we know it is today. Um, and you can also see that the traces we use are starting to be different. They are no longer individual stars. They are things like luminosity functions, the planetary nebula and the globular cluster luminosity functions. They are things like stellar population tracers, surface brightness fluctuations, and the tip of the red giant branch, which are the brightest stars, and you, so you can still see them at Virgo cluster distances. And then we have kinematic scaling relations, uh, Tully Fisher and the fundamental plane, in fact, Faber Jackson, and, and some other uh, measures. The Virgo cluster has fewer distances, as, uh, about 7,900 papers. Um, we looked at some of them in more detail, particularly the TRGB, uh, surface brightness fluctuations, and the, the encephalites. The other two that are on here, NOVI and the PNLF, the planetary nebula luminosity function, were discarded for a variety of reasons. And that led us to a distance uh, to M87, the central galaxy in the Virgo cluster, a distance modulus of 31.03 plus or minus a pretty small error bar, or a distance of 16.07 uh, megaparsecs. Now, that, if that distance is correct, yields a black hole mass in M87 of about 5.9 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. That is lower than the black hole mass advocated by the Event Horizon Telescope. The, the values on the left here show you the uh, distance adopted by the Event Horizon Telescope team and their black hole mass. If you then scale this uh, by the distance that we determined, you get a somewhat smaller uh, black hole mass determination. Um, we continued um, for our final paper. Uh, we looked at the Fornax cluster, which is at the top here, and the Coma cluster, which is at the bottom here. In between, we have relative distance measures between Fornax and Coma on the one hand and Virgo on the other. And so you can again see, again see how the, these measures varied as a function of publication date. Um, we did a lot of analysis here, um, published this earlier this year, actually, um, based on uh, a whole variety of measures. You can see them there. And so, what that leads into are these best values in, of the distance modulus for Fornax and Coma. Now, you can see that for both of these clusters, I provided two values, and they're, they're different from each other by about 0.2 in distance modulus, or about 1.5 or so, or more megaparsecs, depending on the distance, of course. So 0.2 in distance modulus. And we couldn't determine which of the two was better. Because the, the first of those distance moduli, so 31.41 for Fornax and 34.99 for Coma, were the results of direct distance measures publish, published in the literature. The bottom ones, 31.21 and 34.78, were the result of relative distance measures with respect to Virgo. Now, we, had, we thought that we had carefully calibrated uh, our measures with respect to the previous runs on the of the distance ladder, including the Virgo distance, and yet we got this systematic difference of 0.2 magnitude in uh, the distance modulus. So it's still an open question, and that's actually my next project, to really look into the data feeding into the individual distances here for a, a select number of tracers to see if, if we can narrow down where the systematic offset comes from. Because if we are left with a systematic offset of 0.2 magnitudes in the distance modulus at these distances, that renders uh, the evolution of the universe uncertain, for instance. So that's where we are at this, this time. Uh, with Giuseppe Bono, we've uh, published a series of seven papers so far. Um, we looked at, and I just calculated it, 100,032 articles, and I went through all of them um, you know, manually, pretty much. Now, it doesn't mean that I've opened every single article and looked at them in detail. Very, very quickly, you will uh, find, when you go through abstracts or even through titles, that it is quite obvious which papers may or may not, not contain distance measures and which papers will actually adopt previous distance measures. So it's, it's not too difficult to read that out, but it has taken a lot of time. Um, we, we determined a total of 2,200 useful distance measures and we have not found publication bias 
in any of these data sets. So that was, of course, the motivation originally, Schaefer's uh, paper from 2008. We haven't found publication bias, but we've actually come up with a self-consistent set of distance measures, and they're shown here, except for the final two clusters. Um, and so that's also my, my summary slide. I've gone a bit more quickly than I anticipated, but uh, this is where we are, and I'm happy to take some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, great talk and amazing results. <laughs> So, um, yes, now we would like to uh, see if uh, someone has question. If you want to ask a question, I think you, so you should uh, raise your hand. I think you can do that uh, from the participants panel in the bottom. Uh, and if you raise your hand, then uh, we'll unmute you so you can uh, ask uh, a question. You want me to stop sharing my screen? Uh, no, no, I think, uh, as you prefer, right. if you want to, probably it will be uh, useful to have your slides. Uh, so I, I have a couple of questions to ask. Okay. Uh, so, for example, you have been able to measure the distance with a high precision accuracy of uh, different uh, galaxies or in the local group, but are you also able to use these tracers to, for example, to study the, um, not subclusters, but structures in these, uh, in these galaxies? So there is, is there any science that uh, can you do that could be interesting um, and eventually compare it to what we see in the galaxy? So that's a, that's a very good question, and I'll give you, I'll give you two answers. Um, there have been a number of papers that looked at substructure in the Virgo and Fornax clusters. Um, and it looks like Virgo contains two groups. And uh, so we were aware of that. So we were very careful in selecting our distances to only select the distances associated with the group surrounding M87. So that is biased against finding substructure, but we wanted the distance to M87, which is seen as the center of the Virgo cluster. At greater distances, like in coma, um, it, turn, it, turns, it turns out if you go to greater distances, you get fewer distance measures. And so your statistics become uh, poorer. And so there, we didn't specifically look for substructure. We looked at for the center of the cluster, really. And, and so that was what this was, was based on. But in principle, you could do that. And we, we, we just haven't done it. OK, so which means that there is a lot of science that uh, people can do. And would yeah, be I should actually say that if anyone wants to have access to any of our data points, they're all linked from the papers. They're, I've set up a website, and all of the, um, the, the 2,200 distance measures published in, in this uh, series of seven papers are fully available and fully linked to their papers uh, in the database. OK, great. Now I see in the chat that there is another question from uh, Sandy. Uh, I think I can unmute. So, um, uh, Valentin, I think you should unmute. Okay, Sandy, if you want to ask ask the question. Okay, I will ask uh, the question that is written in the chat. So when we will be the colliding neutron stars become useful as a distance measure? Right, so these are gravitational wave sources, clearly. Um, so uh, they, I don't know when, clearly, but um, we have standard candles, standard rulers, and these objects will be standard sirens because uh, depending on their mass, they will give a certain chirp signal, which in principle can be calibrated to give distances. Um, we've got, what is it, a dozen gra gravitational wave uh, sources now, so I think that's not yet good enough, but uh, uh, this measure, this distance measure, is included in my textbook already from 2011 as a potential future measure. Um, I have not heard anyone work on this at the moment, actually, but it would be completely independent um, because it's, it's, it's pretty much as, as uh, a geometric distance measure. But, but when this will be useful, um, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Okay, any other question? I actually have a question. Um, 
a, a naive one and uh, from a, a non-expert at all. Um, so you show the distance estimates for different galaxies of the local group, mm. uh, obtained with different methods or tracers. So to you, what is um, the most accurate methods or tracer nowadays to estimate these distances? Uh, oh, can you explain it in, in layman words? Among yes, these? thank you. That's a, it's a good question, clearly. Um, if we have geometric distance tracers, they would clearly be the best, particularly if they are based on as few um, assumptions as possible. Now, geometric measures include in the Milky Way parallaxes. Um, you can use them pretty much beyond the center of the Milky Way. Um, in uh, the nearest galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds and possibly even M31, uh, we can use eclipsing binaries. Again, you can use them pretty much without too many assumptions. Um, going beyond, NGC 4258 has uh, Maser sources in it and they can be used to look at the rotation of the galaxy and also to provide a geometric distance measure. So those were the best. If you don't have that, or if you only have one single object per galaxy, which doesn't actually give you the distance to the galaxy, but only to the location in the galaxy, which may not be the same. Um, I would say Cepheids and uh, Aralari individually uh, may not work, but as a group, they provide very good distances. And what other people have used, and that's particularly the group around uh, Alan McConaughey at, uh, in Canada, in Victoria, uh, they have used surface brightness fluctuations, particularly for the local group, particularly for M31 and its, uh, its, its group of galaxies. So they, uh, the issue is you can use any given tracer you like. Um, for absolute values, uh, there are some assumptions involved, but for relative values, as long as you stick to the same tracer, you get pretty decent, uh, very accurate relative distance moduli. And so for the local group that's been done with the, CIF, uh, with the surface brightness fluctuations, um, but if you, as I said, if you want uh, absolute values, I would go for the Cepheids probably. Okay, thanks for the clarification. So when several tracers are available, then the uncertainty you quote there is basically a statistical uh, um, average. So, so what, we, what we did in a number of cases, if there were several uh, different tracers, you first of all check whether they are mutually, mutually consistent. If not, you look into why not. So one of the examples I gave here, uh, here for instance, and I have to make you a bit smaller. Um, we looked at, uh, for the Virgo cluster, these, these, these five objects, these five types, sorry, had pretty decent statistics. But we discarded, for instance, the planetary nebula luminosity function. Those are the red data points closest to the bottom. You can see that they all lie a bit below that fiducial horizontal line. And that's because the use of that luminosity function re uh, requires you to look at a cutoff in the luminosity function at bright magnitudes. And in essence, what that means is that you're looking at planetary nebulae that are projected on top of their galaxy. So systematically there is a bias towards closer distances. That's why we discard, discarded them. The Novi we discarded because of the large uncertainties on all of those data points. So we, we looked for mutual consistency and, uh, and then you, yeah, you combine the errors using error propagation. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Uh, yes. Valentin, I, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I couldn't quite follow how you used 87A as a distance measure. Like, uh, I, I could understand how you can measure the size of the ring, but... Um, Sorry, which tracer are you talking about? Uh, 87A, uh, 1987A. 1987A, right. 1987A um, yeah. has a ring of, of material around it. Yeah. You, at the time that this happened, you or shortly afterwards, the the, the flux from the central source uh, fluctuated, and you saw those same fluctuations in the emission coming from the ring. So you could you could tie fluctuations in the central source to fluctuations in the ring, and the time difference was the time it took for light from the supernova to or from the central source to uh, reach the ring, right? And so you know how long that takes, you know that light goes at the speed of light, and that, so you know what uh, the linear distance is between the central source and the ring. At the same time, you can measure 
the angular size between the central source and the ring. So that gives you an angular size in arc second, let's say. Uh -huh. So if you have an angular size and a linear size of the same object on the sky, the scaling relation between the two is the distance to the object. I so think. that's where you get the distance directly. The uncertainty I talked about was whether or not the emission in the ring comes from the inside or from the bulk, and whether there is a timing delay between light hitting the ring and, and the ring em emitting its material. Does that help? Oh, yeah, thank you. Ilya has a question. Um, hi, Richard. Um, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, uh, first, just a quick comment. You, you, um, since you mentioned, and then a question, but the quick comment was you mentioned uh, um, uh, using standard, uh, standard sirens, and of course, there is um, uh, uh, quite a bit of work, actually, some of the people in Monash are involved in it, uh, trying to use the limited number of observations, as you rightly say, but I posted one of the links into the, into the chat, for example, this is a paper from a couple of years ago, based on uh, uh, GW170817, the first double neutral star detection, where there was an attempt to use the gravitational wave signal and the um, uh, electromagnetic redshift together, uh, the gravitational signal to the distance as an independent measurement, the redshift from the, from the known host galaxy to try to uh, constrain the Hubble constant. Now, of course, in that particular case, um, you would have done better in terms of distance measurements to the host by doing surface brightness fluctuations. In fact, with some collaborators, we've done that, and you can get a better distance estimate from surface brightness fluctuations. So you don't need the gravitational wave signal at all. Um, but the idea is that you know it's more of a proof of principle once you get the the uh, error bars uh, uh, sufficiently low, um, then which basically will scale as one over the signal to noise ratio for the roughly the the delta distance over distance so you you know once you get sort of signal ratios of 100 things get interesting basically yeah. is, the, is the short um, answer there but um my question was um you started you know or one of the motivations um, that you mentioned early on were, were the um, um changing measurements of the hubble constant and of course there's still this uh, ongoing uh, debate about uh, um exactly what the value is and whether it's consistent between uh, various local measurements and and uh, uh, let's say early universe measurements in various forms. Um, what do you think is um, from the the kind of distance distance ladder buildup that you're doing? What do you think is sort of most promising as a route to hopefully resolving um, uh, those discrepancies, or at least understanding whether the discrepancies are real or not? Wow, that's a big question. So let me first comment on your on your comments. I have not seen the uh, the, the link in the chat because as a presenter, you have your your chat in a different position. Sorry. I, I just. <laughs> I'll have a look at that paper. Thank you for that. Um, there was a conference earlier this year hosted by ESO um, in July, where uh, the tension in the Hubble constant was the topic of a five day long conference and there was no solution. So if you're asking me to come up with a solution, that is a quite a big, big ask. Having said that, I saw on Astro PH yesterday, there was a paper at uh, that people who use the TRGB, the tip of the red giant branch, and they said there is no tension in the, in the Hubble constant remaining. I haven't read the paper yet, but that's an interesting claim. Um, it seems that the local Hubble constant and the co Hubble constant based on measurements at the edge of the universe, that most of the tension is in, is in that. So does that mean that the Hubble constant actually, well, the idea is of course, the Hubble constant is not a constant, it may be a parameter, it may have changed. I think we need to look into that in more detail, but um, you know, there's a whole, whole lot of people whose expertise is right in that field, Adam Rees being one of them. Um, I don't think we've reached a conclusion yet, and I don't actually, yeah, I don't know how to solve that, this problem. That was the conclusion of the conference as well, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for our last question, or maybe two. Uh, so actually, I have another question. Um, so your result on uh, the 3D map of our galaxy and the warp is a uh, it's fantastic but um so cephates are um, a relatively young uh, tracer so they just uh, i think they just give you a picture of uh, how the galaxy look like now so do you have uh, any other traces that you can uh, uh, use to to see how this work had uh, changed with time? Yeah, so thank you, that's a good question. Um, you're absolutely right, Cepheids are stars with masses between about four and 20 solar masses. That means they must be young, otherwise they would be dead already. Um, and so it traces uh, the first 100 mega years or so, I was 
probably of that order. Um, the competing paper by Scoron looked at the warp as a function of the age of the Cepheid sample. So still within that young age range, but they looked at that and they saw a pro progressive warp. Um, I don't quite remember in which, in which direction that was, but they did see some differences. Um, the warp has, in the Milky Way has been uh, traced by many different traces, including older stars, Aralari, for instance. Um, and I believe that the uh, older stars have a flatter warp and the younger stars show a more, more severe warp. Um, we did talk about that, but I don't actually remember the details of it. Now that Xiao Zhen, my, my former postdoc, who is now a staff member, this is what happens in, in China. If you publish a nature paper, you get a staff position. So this is good for him, of course. Um, and uh, so he's, he's now looking at the, uh, the Zwicky Transient Factory uh, database with, um, we have about 4,000 CEFIs or something of that order, um, which will give us a much better picture. And we've got about a million variable stars in there. Uh, was, it, was the subject of a discovery project that I submitted earlier this year. So I'm not sure if, uh, if I get the money, but I've, I've just appointed a PhD student, uh, still part of my startup here at Macquarie, who will start looking into the shape of the Milky Way based on different types of variables. So there is some work going on. And so um, keep an eye out, I would say. Yeah, that would be great because, for example, I am, uh, what I'm studying is to uh, trace the metallicity, uh, radial metallicity profile based on uh, open clusters. And of course, if the disk is warped, then uh, the outermost clusters uh, should appear at a distance that is close, that is smaller than uh, what they actually are. So, uh, but of course, again, this depends also on the age. So it would be great if... Uh, it seems that the disk starts... Sorry, you're, you fell away. So hopefully you're back now. Ah, okay, okay, sorry. No, I was just saying that it's uh, relevant to my studies to know uh, how this warp has changed with time. So, uh, yeah. you know, the warp starts roughly in the solar neighborhood, just beyond it. Okay, so it's a, it's a very important factor that is usually neglected uh, by most of the studies. That, uh, for example, in my field, uh, I'm studying the metallicity radial profile of the of the galaxy of the disk. So uh, we always neglect this, and uh, of course, it's an important factor that we should include. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think there are no more questions uh, and uh, we are running out of time. Uh, so thank you very much, Richard, and uh, it's been a pleasure to have you today. And uh, hopefully we will have you in person visiting us uh, in the future. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, everybody. Thank you, Richard.